Thanks very much, Phoebe. Do I have control? Just giving it to you now. Beg your pardon. Um, there we go. Yep, all good. All good. Fantastic. Thanks, CB. Uh, welcome, everybody. Um, and thanks very much for sharing your time on a Friday with us on this one. Uh, my name's Phil, as um, Phoebe said. Some of you, I think, I possibly know um, either through uh, working connections or, in fact, that you've, uh, I've trained with you at some point in Firebrand as well. But uh, for those of you that don't know me, as Phoebe has kind of um, said, this is me. Um, I've actually been a permanent instructor with Firebrand uh, for five years, in fact. So I've actually been on their permanent staff. In fact, this is going into my sixth year with them. But as Phoebe mentioned, I've known and worked alongside Firebrand since 2008. Um, prior to uh, becoming a trainer, I was a, a freelance trainer and consultant with my own business, in fact. Prior to that, I worked at a Microsoft Academy for a couple of years. And before that, I was actually in the military. So I was an intelligence analyst in the RAF for 23 years, in fact, uh, which took me through a whole series of different um, avenues, I suppose, really, that I explored. Um, I left in 2007, joined the Microsoft Academy because I found that was a far more lucrative way of, of earning a living. I did that for a couple of years, but sort of went into the network networking security field um, sort of fairly quickly, I re really, after I left the military, which kind of saw me moving more into a training consultant role, I suppose, really, because that's my background. Uh, as Phoebe mentioned, really, uh, when I, I was taken on by Firebrand five years ago to head up um, part of the uh, cybercrime division that we had at um, Firebrand, and I eventually then sort of morphed into the project lead for our cybercrime um uh, courses at the bespoke ones that we gave out to law enforcement we've now kind of moved away a little bit from delivering those foundation courses from the law enforcement side of things but still deal with some of the sort of higher echelon the protect and some of the uh, pursue side of things and also some of the open source stuff from an encryption point of view when we're looking at cryptography I've kind of seen it from all angles I suppose really so uh, back in the good old days when I first joined the Royal Air Force uh, I looked at uh, systems, uh, communication systems. This is when we were talking about telephony, telegraphy and things like that. Some of you probably don't even remember these types of um, systems. And part of my uh, job, as it were, as a junior technician back then was something called systems, which was actually creating uh, bid boxes, old uh, circuits uh, for the encrypted systems that we used to send messages from one place to another uh, on the circuits within the uh, military. My understanding is that th things have not really changed too much, in fact. So if there are any of you out there that are actually part of the MOD or military are probably looking to the sky now thinking, yeah, we, we're still using those. Uh, then when I came over into the world of intelligence, I really then saw, kind of saw on the receive end, I suppose, really, and spent a lot of my time really working with both signals intelligence and human intelligence, I suppose, realistically on the, on the receive side of that, uh, working with agencies and, and in, invariably directly with GCHQ, so again, I kind of saw it, I suppose, really from the end user sort of thing. Uh, and there, in fact, I've worked with some very talented and gifted individuals, in fact. So, so not were we sort of creating, I suppose, really then uh, ultimately the aim then was to secure it and, of course, to break it. Uh, and now I train it. Um, so from a training point of view, I very quickly kind of moved into the world of Microsoft. So when it came to the establishment of things like PKI, identification authorities and things like that, it was kind of like a natural leap really for me to start looking at the administration side of things, which I did realistically, I suppose, really for two or three years before I went out into the consultancy role. Um, from a training point of view then, uh, as Phoebe um, said, this is really what I look after. Um, mostly looking now at from the security side of things with the cybersecurity apprenticeships, the technical uh, um, apprenticeships that they um, they lead at Firebrand, uh, and also still dabble with the uh, cybercrime side of things, as I've mentioned before. And, and again, we're moving into a sort of a, a new era with that uh, Firebrand. I also keep hold of my Microsoft route, so I still do some of the systems administration side of things, although a lot of that now is sort of on the back burner for me, right? sort, of, sort of just to keep my hand in. Uh, most of what I'm in fact looking at uh, now are EC Council, CompTIA courses as well, so some of the lower echelon security courses, and the BCS side of things, which look after our apprenticeships for us at, um, at Firebrand. So 
Um, so that's kind of me. You're not here to, to learn about me. What you're here to hopefully look at is the art of cryptography. So today's um, little session, so this morning's session, I've broken down into sort of four key areas, I suppose, really. And what this course is, is, is kind of a little bit of everything. So it's, a, it's, it's kind of taken and selected, I suppose, really from uh, some CompTIA kind of thing, some IRC squared, some EC Council, a little bit of Microsoft thrown in there as well. And what you get, a little bit of BCS as well, is kind of an overview, I suppose, really, of four, what I consider to be sort of key subject areas. So first and foremost, we'll take a look at the basic theory of cryptography. So um, definitions, I suppose, really terminology and things like that. And that's kind of important um, because uh, when we're looking at definitions in security, if you've been working in security for some time, you know that depending upon who the vendor is, depending upon your certification track or indeed the technology that you're working on, there are slight variations sometimes on the actual wordage and the terminology that's used here. So I've kind of taken, I, I suppose, a little bit from everywhere to put it all together, to bring it into uh, the most common terminology, I suppose, that we use with crypto. And what does it mean? That's the most important thing. It's all very well being able to define things and put things into little boxes. But this is more about uh, sort of understanding what these terms mean rather than, uh, than what they are. Then we're going to take a look at how uh, crypto is used. So the deployment of cryptography that should take us up to a tea break let's keep as uh, phoebe has mentioned so what we'll do is we'll have a quick sort of q a session then so keep firing the questions at phoebe as we're going through any comments that you you have um i do have an eye on the chat side of things but but i've also got an eye on about 15 different screens in front of me as well so i apologize if i don't see uh, your your comments as they come through phoebe's going to look after that for us as we go through so We'll restart um, after we've had a quick cup of tea. Uh, and then the second session will hopefully demystify uh, the art of the public key infrastructure, PKI. And again, um, quite unreservedly, really, I, I shall look at this really from a non-vendor point of view, but a lot of this will be also based on my experience, I suppose, with dealing with it from a Microsoft point of view. And then the final little bit that we will look at will be uh, it, uh, under the title of issues and jurisdictions. So what's cryptography not so good for? What kind of things would we need to consider, especially if we're dealing with things like encryption, um, which is not always the godsend that we think it is, and also the jurisdiction side of things. So uh, from a legal point of view and the standards that are out there that we also need to consider as well. Again, I'm not really going to go well I'm, uh, into too much depth and detail with any of this as we go through. So if there are uh, more technical questions that need answering, please fire them across to Phoebe. If I can answer them as we're going through the session, then fantastic. If not, uh, just make sure that you capture my email address and fire them to me. Uh, and I promise you that I'll get back to you with the answers. It might be the fact that I don't know the answer to your question, of course, uh, depending upon which angle you're coming from. So, um, so I'll hold my hands up and say, I don't obviously know everything there is to know about everything about IT systems. Um, I've kind of pitched this at the fact that there's no real pre prerequisite knowledge required, as you can see. So I'm kind of um, starting at a base level, I suppose, really, and we'll build up a little bit. But some of it will require you to have a technical understanding about IT systems and networking. Again, if you have any issues with that, then just sort of fire the questions over and I'll try and explain them either in the Q&A Q &A or as we go along. Uh, from a course point of view, then, as I said, I've kind of um, mixed this up a little bit, really. So if you are in a studying mode, excuse me, um, this will see you good really across the vendors, most of the sort of the main security vendors that we pitch at um, Firebrand. So you can see their badges there, CompTIA all the way through to Cisco. But it doesn't really matter um, because... The, the, the sort of the uh, the top of cryptography here sort of cuts across a whole load of levels really so so what I'm not going to do is get too technical with this I'm not going to get too managerial with it but hopefully it'll give you a good overview and a good taster I suppose really of different areas and perhaps you're also going through the study as we speak so if this is kind of going to round you off on a certification path great if this is going to kind of light the the touch paper if you like that's what we're after really to sort of ignite a little bit of interest to take your uh, knowledge further then that's absolutely fantastic okay perfect um, and that's really what we're trying to do so as I said keep firing the questions and comments as we go through 
Um, but we're going to start off really with some sort of basics and the basics, um, any good security course really starts with the basic fundamentals. Now, what I'm not going to do, I've got a whole different sort of uh, uh, set of tools that I'm going to use hopefully to deliver this to you. What I'm not going to do is read PowerPoint slides to you because that's not what we do. Um, uh, firebrand training is sort of stand in front of you all day, just going next, 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 because, well, it's very easy work for an instructor, of course, but it invariably means you're not going to learn a great deal. So, so I'm also going to assume that uh, you can read the PowerPoint slides and kind of deduce them. If there's anything that you don't understand on the, um, uh, the slides, and again, fire that across to Phoebe and I'll try and explain it as we go through. So, um, so this is what we're going to do. We're going to start to look at some of the basic concepts to start off with. And as I said, no good security course is uh, worth its weight in gold unless the idiot instructor starts mentioning these frameworks at you. And the, probably the biggest one, and certainly if we're talking about things like data protection, is the CIA of security. Now, this, uh, this boy has been knocking around forever. In fact, I, in fact I, can't, I don't think I can remember a waking moment uh, when somebody didn't mention the CIA to me on a security course. So confidentiality, integrity and availability is what CIA stands for if you've not come across it before. And as I said, it is really the mainstay for uh, mostly looking at data protection, but it's now kind of morphed, I suppose, really into the mainstay when we're looking at a lot of security concepts within the world of IT, data protection, uh, and, and also from the management side of things, I suppose, really when we're looking at uh, threat and risk analysis as well. You'll notice, however, that even though the CIA triad gets a mention in here, A is not the A that you think it is. So confidentiality, integrity, and availability is the CIA. Um, here, I've deliberately kind of missed availability off when we're dealing with cryptography because cryptography is mostly about confidentiality and integrity of data, protecting your data by means of confidentiality so keeping it safe and secure so only the right eyes can see it and the digital integrity of the data making sure that as it goes from a to b for example it's intact and indeed that nobody has conducted any kind of evil operation as it goes man in the middle attacks for example as it goes from one place to another and this is what uh, cryptography deals with now notice that i'm talking about cryptography here and not necessarily encryption encryption is just one part of this whole process and encryption is a big mainstay, I suppose, really, when we're trying to maintain confidentiality. Anything at all that I layer over data, however, so if I encrypt something, both systems have, have got to be able to encrypt it and decrypt it. So invariably what you may find that if you use too much encryption or too strong an encryption, you may actually negate the availability side of things. So what I give you with one hand from a security side of things and protecting your data, for example, I may be taking away with another hand in the fact that users cannot simply open that file or the system cannot accept that level of encryption that you put into it. So you may find that from the outside, outset, you may be actually negating the whole point of uh, keeping your data safe Okay, if it's not available to anybody, then there's no point in, in fact doing it. So, so this is the offset that we will see when we're looking at cryptographic systems. And again, the other thing that we kind of have to layer into this as well, that as soon as we start talking about security, and again, if you've been into a, into a procurement meeting or into a management meeting, and you've got your IT, your systems ad administrators are in there, and they're talking about securing networks and securing data and protecting data and things like this, there's a cost implication this might be cost monetary cost it might be time in here as well it might be downtime to systems and so on and so forth and that never meets with a, a popular sort of nod from uh, budget controllers and budget managers when we start thinking about the fact there's no real major profitability you're going to get from encrypting data it just means to say that your data is going to be safe and secure now again I'm playing devil's advocate a little bit. There might be some of you out there going, well, that's absolute tosh and nonsense. I, I totally agree with you in the fact that, of course, you need to be keep, keeping your data safe and secure because of legislation, regulation, and standards that you put into place as well and will betide you if you don't because there will be financial penalty or any, any other kind of punitive measure that may be taken if you don't take these steps. So again, uh, you, you know, I, invariably what I'm doing here is just playing devil's advocate with the fact that sometimes there's no profit to be had for, by using encryption systems. So that's why I've kind of left availability out of this. And again, I'll talk to you a little bit about that in the final module. What it does layer in, however, is the a way that we can look at authentication and non-repudiation. Now, these are good, two good terms. 
invariably that we bandy around a lot in the world of security. Authentication is proving to the system who you say you are by using one or more identity or authentication process or protocol. So uh, the classic example of this, of course, is a username and a password, which is proving your identity, and that's an authentication method. It could also be a smart card or a token. And again, a smart card uses uh, cryptography for this. So that's a certificate that's embedded within that device that invariably then unlocks the system. Uh, and also then it could also be a biometric device as well. So those are the three main authentication types that we talk about here. And certification, uh, certificates and uh, encryption, cryptography is used predominantly within the world of authentication. So hooking onto websites, for example, and gaining access to IT systems if you're not using a username and a password. Non-repudiation is another term that gets thrown around a lot here. And from, the, from an English point of view, it, it's, uh, it's one of those things which grammatically doesn't really work um, because what we have here is a double negation. Repudiation is the fact that you can deny something. So if I send you an email and you didn't like the contents of it, I could deny sending it. Say, well, no, actually that didn't come from me. And the recipient would have no way of judging whether or not I was telling the truth or not. Non-repudiation um, is not that. So it means that there's no way that I can de deny sending it. And so this would be seen in the form of using some form of a hash or a digital signature. And again, hashing is not cryptography, okay, or it's not encryption, I should say. Uh, and sometimes there's a, there's a bit of confusion between what hashing is. So hopefully we'll also put that to bed as we go through today's little session as well. The non-repudiation side of things uses a digital certificate, which is all about uh, using cryptography, and that uses something called an asymmetric process. And again, we'll discuss the difference between symmetric and asymmetric in a little bit. And again, sort of a bit of a basics, I suppose, really, for those of you that are uh, fundamentally looking after data protection, and that is everybody who's on this call and pretty much everybody who's on the planet, I have to say. So if you, if you don't think data protection is your thing, think again is in, in very what I would suggest and it has three states if you like so data at rest data in transit and data in use and the states that we put um, data in I'm not going to go through what is data what's a computer and things like this is generally the kind of things that I love to play around with with my uh, foundation courses and, and my apprentices in particular to get them to define what data is and things like this is generally a great way of, of of sort of breaking the ice and also finding the nerds in the in in the pack as well because when people start talking about ones and zeros too I know exactly where they're coming from um, uh, and I kind of love those kind of challenges as well but it is quite a difficult thing just so so sort of stop for a moment and think well what actually does he mean what do, what do we mean by data on this little session what we're going to talk about uh, invariably will also be the way that data it can be encrypted okay where we can use cryptography to get it from one place to another and that's huge at the moment isn't it i mean it, we're talking about vpns we're talking about using these video conferencing systems and information systems to to convey our data from one place to another and depending upon the level of confidentiality and the level of integrity that you need to put into that data will depend upon the system that you're using and the encryption standard that you are using within it okay vpns for example your systems administrators hopefully don't just throw these things together they do actually have uh, a thought process that goes through that looks at the actual content the data that's going to be moving from one place to another and if that's important to you which I, invariably it will be, um, then those concepts have to be layered in when you choose the right kind of VPN tunnel. Um, so that's data in transit. When we're talking about data at rest, we're talking about storing, invariably using some form of encryption. So that traditionally is stored on a hard drive somewhere, possibly within your location, so on premise. But of course, these days, uh, we're now talking about a lot of storage, which happens up in the cloud, up in the cloud, uh, happens in the cloud, I should say. And of course, all that is, is just somebody else's hard drive somewhere out on the internet, invariably. So, so you've got, we've got two elements here. We've got to get the data from A to B, so that data in transit. And then we need to think about the confidentiality and the integrity, integrity of the data when it's at, at rest. And again, another good question to ask yourself here is for those of you that are using storage as a service, so cloud providers that store your data for you, do you really know how your data goes from point A to point B, what kind of encryption is being used? And indeed, when it's received by that uh, storage provider, how they are encrypting it and how they are actually managing their access to it, who's got access to it. These are questions 
that would be asked from a management point of view. And these would be questions that would be asked when we're looking at the uh, threat and risk invariably to your data. And, and, and cloud, again, is, is one of those kind of big issues. Some of you invariably on this call may not be using uh, cloud, traditional cloud, internet-based uh, storage uh, because of the legislation and, and restrictions that are in place because of these, these uh, different uh, aspects of it. These days, I have to say, certainly sort of over the past sort of five to 10 years, things have tightened up a lot, in fact. And in, in fact, cloud providers have, are now fully aware of the legislation and restrictions that have been put in place. So things like financial institutes, government organizations, and so on and so forth, whether or not your data, in fact, can be stored uh, within the UK, for example, so you may have national boundaries that you have to adhere to as well, whereas previously it was very difficult to actually monitor that and actually, of course, to police it. We didn't really know where our data went to up in the cloud. And again, it's another game I like to play uh, when we're talking about cloud storage uh, as, a, as a service is uh, most of us invariably, a lot of us probably on this call will be using some form of free storage, so Dropbox and iCloud, OneDrive, those kind of um, uh, storage as a service providers, but do you really know where your data is and who's got access to it and how does it get there? And the, there's a very good chance that you know is the answer. You think that Microsoft are, are, are safe, you think that Apple are safe, you think that um, Dropbox is a safe entity, and of course they are. Uh, you know, they, uh, they, uh, I'm not suggesting for one moment that they're not, uh, but we have no idea or understanding or indeed uh, are we really too bothered by it as a, as a home user? Uh, by what actually happens to our data when it goes out there. Of course, as soon as it gets leaked or there's some kind of breach there, then we are bothered by it. Uh, and again, it's our lookout. And I challenge you again to have a look at your terms and conditions, um, the actual service level agreement that you have with these providers, because I can tell you, if you read the small print, you really haven't got a leg to stand on when it comes to the confidentiality and the integrity uh, and or indeed the availability of your data when it's up in the cloud. And crypto, cryptography, of course, can help in all this. So a little bit of knowledge a little bit of understanding about what all these terms mean might go a long way. So here is a, a kind of a fine list, I suppose, really. Uh, and again, like I said, I've taken this from across the bazaars. So have a little quick read of that while I have a slip of water. Excuse me. Uh, and you can see that um, crypt and cipher appear a lot in here. And that's sort of the, sort of the ancient art of hiding stuff. So when we're dealing with uh, cryptographic systems or any kind of cipher, what we're trying to do is make it unreadable uh, for human eyes invariably. So, so we talk about things like cipher text and we talk about the cipher itself, which is the system that's employed within the art, if you like, of encrypting something. So we talk about cipher systems. Notice also then we've got something called an algorithm that's used as well. And again, these are this is a mathematical process that hopefully calculates whether or not your A-levels results were good, bad, or indifferent. But th in this in case, in, in this time, however, what we're talking about are encryption algorithms that invariably determine how uh, and to what strength uh, data. And here I am talking about the way that the ones and zeros are all jumbled up, if you like, uh, so that they do not represent any form of the original data. Okay, one of the most important parts of this cryptographic system that we're looking at. Most, one of, certainly the most important part of the cipher mechanism is the very last word on this list, in fact, which is the key. Okay, so when we're looking at um, what a key actually is, that's the thing that needs to be protected, okay, in the most form. So if I just uh, bang off of my PowerPoint slides for a moment, and hopefully you can now see my whiteboard. Again, I apologize to you. I'm not Leonardo da Vinci or Banksy or anybody like that. So, um, so using my Microsoft whiteboard here, what we have going on here then. So this system here would be my cipher. And again, as I apologize to you, cause it's very difficult to actually draw on this screen as I'm going. So just let me, um, let me do this nice and neat for you. And so this is going to be the actual process, remember, of going from uh, plain text, which is a file that you can invariably read, so for human eyes. So here's my plain text. And by running it through the cipher, I'm going to create ciphertext so nobody can read it. 
Now the cipher tells me how this takes place. So this could be a simple, uh, so a simple uh, example of this would be something like a shift cipher. So move one character forward or move 10 characters forward or move 10 forwards and then two back and three down. So depending upon the shift pattern that you want to put into place, okay, that's the cipher. Now, as soon as the mathematicians put these ciphers together, so as soon as the technical people put these ciphers together, they know full well that within a fullness of time, the cipher is going to be known by somebody. It will not take people too long or, or uh, systems too long to actually work out what is the pattern that we're seeing here. Move forward 10, move back two, move down three, for example. And as kids, you probably did this. I remember sort of... Uh, Again, I, I remember as a kid getting the Beano, the original one, and every now and then sort of to promote the comics and things like this, they would sellotape like these little plastic games on them and things like this. And there might be a grid on it that allowed you then to, to use a simple little shift cipher mechanism in order to send encoded messages from you to your mates and things like this. Some of you may remember these halcyon days. Um, and that effectively was a simple Caesar cipher, a simple shift cipher that had a grid. So if I was to send A1, for example, the recipient would then need to look on it and say, right, okay, this equates to the letter H. And then it would shift over and it would then be move 10 characters forward and that would be E, move five characters forward and that would be L, for example. Now, that's all well and good because the cipher itself is going to be the thing that sellotape to every single comic. So every single kid will receive the same cipher. The key to this, no pun intended, is the fact that you need to know what the actual key is that it is being used alongside the cipher. So in a simple shift cipher, for example, if I was to say that this was going to move one character forward, so this is a very simple shift cipher for you. Okay. And then wrote my encrypted text on the cipher text. So the, the output is now IFFMP. Okay, there are probably some of you out there with uh, very mathematical processes that are taking place here. They're saying, okay, well, that's very straightforward, Phil, because all you've done is shifted one character forward in the English alphabet, A to Z. And you would be correct, because the key to this would be the 26 characters that you're using, or that we use in the English alphabet of A to Z. Now all you need to do is now that you know the key is you now to decipher this. So de-encrypt it by moving one character back. And of course, hopefully you would then be able to work this out and you would then be able to get your plain text back. So whichever way you want to go here, the cipher tells you how it's done. The key tells you on what to base that cipher mechanism. Okay. The secret to all of this, the thing that you need to keep secret is that is your private key okay and the problem you have when you only use a single private key is the movement of that key from one place to another so if bob good old bob is going to send something to alice alice will need to know what the private key is she will also need to know what cipher mechanism is going to be used okay now these are simple processes that we're talking about and this is what we call a symmetric process that only uses one key a symmetric key, and that's your private key. These systems are still in place today. And so if I could flip back over onto my slides. The example that I've just given you, in fact, is this. Okay, so this is, uh, this goes back, in fact, it's called a Caesar cipher because it goes back to, uh, to Roman times invariably because uh, there's nothing new in the art of encryption. Okay, and different sort of techniques have been used over the years, in fact, to actually hide data as it goes from one place to another. It's all very well having secrets, but secrets are great when you can share them. And so here we have got uh, an example of a shift cipher. And you can see here that the cipher is shift 10. And so using the key again, which would be the English alphabet, A becomes, t becomes K. So alpha becomes kilo because you've shifted forwards 10 characters in the English alphabet. And now using this very rudimentary system, you would then be able to send encrypted messages from one place to another. 
The recipient would need to know, of course, that not only are you shifting 10, that it's also based on the English alphabet. Okay, A equals K. So again, it doesn't necessarily, of course, in real uh, cryptography terms, we don't use the English alphabet A to Z. What is used in here is a private key, but in exactly the same way, that private key still needs to be passed from one place to another. And so this causes us a problem. When we're using symmetric systems, if you're going to share the data from one place to another, the private key has to get from A to B. So Bob can encrypt things all day long using symmetric cryptography and if he's going to store that stuff locally or for only for his use, it's a perfect way of doing it. It's very fast. It's a very effective, a very efficient way of encrypting stuff. And it's still used, of course, today. So symmetric cryptography is still uh, one of the mainstay ways that we encrypt stuff. The problem comes, however, when we need to get that data from one place to another and a recipient needs to open that up. So the key needs to be sent. There are two kind of effective ways, I suppose, that we can share a private key. And these are inbound and outer bound. And so in, uh, in band and out of band, I beg your pardon. So in band um, is a fairly sort of rudimentary way of actually sending the key alongside the um, encrypted material and out of band is sending it by a different mechanism. So for example, if I was going to send you something um, in a locked box, so for, it, for the security of it going from A to B so that you can then unlock it, I would sellotape the key to the top of the box. Well, of course, if evil dude or um, anybody was to intercept that box, they would also then also have the key so they could quite easily unlock it. So it's a fairly ineffective way of sending stuff from one place to another. If I send you the locked box and then by a different mechanism send you the key, however, then ultimately that's a more safe and secure way of actually the recipient then being able to unlock things and protecting and maintaining the confidentiality and the integrity of the data or the contents of the box. But of course, you still have the vulnerability of the box being intercepted and indeed the key being intercepted or indeed being calculated based on the interception techniques. And again, there are plenty of great uh, examples of this, but probably one of the best examples of this that I generally use when I'm training this is the Enigma uh, system that was used in World War II by the Germans. And if you ever get a chance, well, I think it might now be open. I think they need your help. Uh, get have a have a road trip to Bletchley Park. Um, social distancing and keep a safe distance and wash your hands and do everything else that you need to do. Wear a face mask over there, but go and see that. If you ever get a chance to go and visit the good people over there, it's a fantastic day out. Um, uh, but also then sort of a, a, a talks to you about the way that the Enigma uh, machine, great German engineering, fantastic um, from a technical point of view was, was superb, but the symmetric key was the downfall and that was the vulnerability in the movement of one, play, of one thing to another. And even though we've kind of seen the movie, and not taking anything away from Turin and his team, um, the code breakers uh, uh, that were over at Bletchley and other places as well, who did a great job, in fact. And again, I can kind of allude to this a little bit because a lot of uh, what they did was um, the uh, encrypted side of things that was using repeated characters in there. And that's also something to avoid when we're looking at uh, encryption in particular. Um, what isn't sort of mentioned so much in the film is the fact that they found the key. Okay, so uh, so the great people that were were fighting on the fronts, especially Polish resistance fighters who were coming obviously from the east, um, big up to them, uh, they started to find the encrypted decipher keys uh, and of course then started to report that through the intelligence agencies out in Europe and eventually back through London, back up into um, uh, Bletchley and things like that, which then obviously made it very easy to start unraveling these things because we had the key. Uh, and again, not taking any kind of kudos away from, from Turing and his team, who did a fan fantastic job from the compute side of things, of course, and unraveling things. So, so with two kind of cryptanalysis systems working together, it was relatively straightforward, towards the, certainly towards the end of the Second World War, for the Enigma codes to be broken. Again, I think if the film was all about Polish resistance finding books, uh, and there's some great stories about how they did this, and, and indeed uh, the Allied uh, uh, soldiers and, and, and seamen in particular as well, so the Navy, Navy assets as well that did some great work with this as well, it would be a very short film, okay, and it would probably just be called The Book because that's what they found. Okay, so, so symmetric encry encryption still with us today. There are some sort of key downfalls, I suppose, with it, but there are also some key upsides to it as well. So it's very, very good for confidentiality and it's very quick. It will not allow you to use uh, non-repudiation. So it's, it's not used for authentication 
and non-repudiation that we use an asymmetric process for example and as i mentioned so there is this private key that needs to be kept secret at all times and that's your, that's the problem with it the ciphers themselves then fall into two categories and again i'm going to kind of show you this at some pace i don't if you were on a course phil would be saying see this list learn this list okay a lot of these invariably are not are no longer used okay um and invariably some of them might if you are involved in this in any shape or form uh, you will remember the days of data encryption standard good old des and triple des these days we're talking about aes the advanced encryption standards but all of these are still valid okay so aes don't be too bothered obviously by the numbers and the uh, facts and figures on here uh, really it's kind of just to give you a flavor of the kind of strengths of encryption i suppose really that we're looking at um, when we're looking at these symmetric uh, systems and they're broken down into two a stream cipher uh, the only one that's an example on this one is called rc4 which is a fairly old stream cipher um, pretty well known in the world of uh, wi-fi for example so web and WPA, in fact, used RC4 as stream cipher encryption standards. And now that gets bad press. Uh, the encryption standard itself is not too bad. Um, the vulnerability of those kind of systems is something called the initialization vector, which again, I'll, I'll uh, give you a quick mention when we get there. But you can also see that what uh, the uh, block size is here. So for the block ciphers, which will take 64 or 128 bits of data, and then work its magic against it. So rather than doing bit by bit by bit by bit, which ultimately is what a stream cipher does, it will take a block of data. If it doesn't have enough bits to create a block, then it pads it out. So it'll actually fill up the block space to make sure that it's got enough ones and zeros for the actual algorithm to work against. And again, that's called padding. Okay, so stream ciphers, there they are. So a couple of good examples of that, RC4. Uh, GSM encryption as well, so mobile uh, phones, uh, cell phone encryption as well uses something called A5 uh, systems as well. So these are, uh, again, not necessarily in common use, I'd have to say. Some of these are quite old. Um, and as, I can see, as you can see by the uh, second bullet point in here as well, uh, all of this starts, all of these encryption processes start with something called an initialization vector. And invariably with all of these encrypted systems, whether it be a stream or a block cipher, there's your vulnerability. Okay, it starts off with a randomly generated number. Now, how random is random is a great cartoon, in fact, if you, if you can Google that, um, because there's a random number generator that can, continues to uh, regurgitate the number four. And you, you never really understand quite how random that actually is. Um, and there are different systems that we build into IT and into encryption systems as well that allow us to create random numbers. So random number generators, pseudo random number gener generators, for example. And it uses, a, uh, some of them also use a system which is called entropy, which is a way that you can use random inputs into a computer, for example, for complete randomness. But again, unfortunately, uh, random is in invariably in the eye of the beholder. Then we're talking quick, very quickly about block ciphers. And again, I don't need to really badger you too much with these. So there you can see some good examples at the bottom of this. So DES, data encryption standard, and really the interim between going from the data encryption standard to the advanced encryption standard, which is the one that we primarily use today, uh, was triple DES. Uh, and again, you still may see these, in fact. So um, some systems, some older legacy systems may still use DES and triple DES, in fact. Okay, so these are broken down into, as you can see, the different uh, block blocks. So 64 and 128 bit, for example. And the key difference here, I suppose, really, with all of these different block ciphers is something called a mode of operation. Now, for anybody who has looked at um, cryptography, has met the challenge of doing a SIS course, for example, you will have come across these modes of operation. And again, I, these... Um, invariably are the ways that the different blocks are taken and ultimately kind of shifted around a little bit to actually create the next encrypted block. There are some good ones and there are some bad ones. Okay, I'm not gonna go through every single one with you, but in this list, you can see that ultimately uh, going from ECB, the electronic code book, which is invariably the one that's not used so much these days because of the vulnerabilities involved with it. I'm gonna give you a little example of this in a little bit. We can go through a couple that use, or one that uses something called blockchaining, and then we've got feedback. So cipher feedback and output feedback, which are very, very similar in the way that they do their business. And also then something called a counter 
and the Galois counter mode as well. These are all, all very popular, I have to say. So the C, uh, GCM uh, Galois counter mode uh, also allows you to do uh, something called message authentication as well. So, so that's quite widely used because it allows you to have uh, both encryption and authentication at the same time. You see that a lot, in fact, out on internet resources, for example. Now, ECB, I'm picking on this piece because it is still used. You will still see ECB being used quite widely. And if I go back to the comment I made about um, repetition, repeated blocks or repeated bits within an encrypted message, invariably are to be avoided. And unfortunately, what ECB does is that it invariably, depending upon the uh, nature of the file that you're trying to encrypt or decipher in here, actually allows you to uh, quite easily, in some cases, not necessarily see the original, uh, but it's not too difficult for crypto systems to actually work out what the original input is. Uh, so that one invariably is the one that's sort of probably got the most vulnerability at this moment in time. And in fact, I can give you an example of this. Now, normally, uh, this would be uh, an exercise that you could do. And invariably, if you want do want the um, instructions on how to do this, um, I'm quite happy to send this uh, out. So either through Phoebe or or just get in touch and I can show you how I've done this. But but what I've done is I've kind of pre-populated this just to kind of save time a little bit, uh, is I've got a couple of virtual machines that I'm going to use for demo purposes. So up here on my Linux machine, I'm using Ubuntu for this, but uh, any Linux will do um, for this. I have got uh, a couple of PPM files, a couple of pictures uh, that I have uh, plain text. So a uh, picture of a little penguin here, Tux. And uh, I've also then used CBC and ECB in here. And if I just open up my pictures for you to see, so there's the original file. As you can see, you can see that that's obviously the Linux Penguin. I think his name is Tux. Oops, that's the original file. Okay, and then as you can see through here, I've now used ECB to encrypt this. Now, I, to do this, I used an AES, 128-bit AES um, algorithm for this. Um, even though you would not, if I was to show you this, this picture, even though you would probably not be able to say, yeah, that's definitely Tux the Penguin, if you compare it with the original, you can make out the outline and the shape of this. You can also see repeated blocks from the background. And if you remember here, we're looking at an image, so the output of this. If I was to take a look at the ones and zeros and probably get a cryptanalysis on this, then I would then start to see the actual blocks of the different colors that were coming through. Now, depending upon what type of algorithm I used in here, sometimes um, these come out and you can actually see them defined. So if you, if you get a chance to have a play around with this little lab, have a little play around with it. And you can get those, I think it's David Hockney that, that did all the different um, Marilyn Monroe pictures all in different colors and things like this. You can actually get a picture of your uh, choosing and you can sort of get nine of these all done with a with a uh, an ECB encryption on and it looks quite neat. Looks quite neat to a nerd like me. So if we're going from plain text, that is ciphertext. So we are looking at something of course that's encrypted in here using ECB. Now if I now step this boy up to actually looking at something that's using CBC here, so now I'm using blockchaining in here, you have no idea about what the contents of that is. So that's a completely jumbled up pixelated picture now. So the ones and zeros have been now moved around to the point where you'd be, it would be very, very difficult to actually meet the challenge of unraveling that. And all I've done there is just stepped up from the different mode of operation, uh, ultimately from ECB to CBC. Okay, and that's a great little demo. And, and like I said, depending upon the type of encryption algorithm that you're gonna use on that, sometimes the outputs of this, you can actually see that that's a penguin. I've, I've just chosen to use a, a slightly stronger encryption for this AES128. Okay, but uh, hopefully you can see as I flick through, okay, kind of not a penguin, but uh, the shape is there, but definitely not anything that you'd be able to um, categorize as being a penguin or anything else, in fact. So, so the mode of operation is an important aspect to you. What I'm giving you with one hand, of course, I'm taking away with another because even though for that particular demonstration, we're talking about nanoseconds, if we were talking about a lot of data, 
okay, the mode of operation may also, also then start to leverage in a little bit of time here. Okay, so what you might find by over encrypting or using a different mode of operation is a little bit of latency in this. So it depends on whether or not you want the availability side of things. So if you want your users to be able to open up an image or op open up a file, I beg your pardon, and don't have that kind of wait time, okay, that's when you need to then do your homework to find out what kind of um, uh, encryption and what kind of mode of operation is good for you okay what kind of system is going to be good for you to use okay and again this would be also be part of uh, the legislation standards and regulations as well so again some have uh, uh, legislative standards that you would need to adhere to in which case you've got no option you must maintain the confidentiality and the integrity at that particular level and the offset of that unfortunately is the availability which takes me back to my original thought process of why availability doesn't really feature in this. Okay. Uh, for those of you that have done or are doing a CIS course, learn these. Okay. Because um, they do like a little bit of this in the domains on CISP as well. Um, so get to know these quite well. In fact, so, and, and there's only one way that you can do that is come and speak to Firebrand, get Rimi to show you exactly how these things break down and you won't go too far wrong with it. Okay, uh, these are very good. Okay, and as I said, these are widely used this day. That's a little demo that I've just done. Here are some other bits of terminology, I suppose, really, when we're dealing with um, the uh, modes of operation. So padding that I've mentioned, initialization vectors, XORing or exclusive, or is the process of invariably of, of contrasting a one and a zero. So comparing a one and a zero. And again, without getting sort of too geeky, a lot of different systems, in fact, use this process where they will do an anding process, if you like, which we see um, from a networking side of things where uh, you can see if the bits are the same value, it's a zero. And if they're different, it will end up as a one. Parity systems that you might come across. So uh, things like parity disks and parity RAM will use a similar kind of process where they compare a zero with a zero and a zero with a one, for example. Uh, number once or nonce is this randomly generated number which is only used one time, and hence the number once as well. And again, these are effective for the starting process of your encryption. So to recap on uh, the symmetric side of things, still with us. So even though we've got the vulnerability of this key exchange from one place to another, it's fast. It's a, it's a, it's a quicker way of encrypting stuff. So if you've got something that's going to be locally encrypted, so your data is at rest locally on your hard drives, symmetric is a good way to go forwards. If you are looking at moving data, however, from one place to another, uh, and or indeed giving the insurance of its integrity as it goes from one place to another, symmetric encryption is not, or symmetric cryptography is not going to allow you to do that, unfortunately. And that's when you then need to move up into the second way of looking at this using something called asymmetric. Now this uses something called a key pair. So here we're talking about a public and a private key. Um, so and that leads us in quite nicely to the public key um, uh, infrastructure that we'll talk about after tea break so here you can see that asymmetric gives me all of the above plus non-repudiation and the ability to use digital signatures so again if you need to identify and verify the fact that something's gone from a to b um, with little or no um, uh, interception at all then uh, you need to digitally sign it digital signatures again uh, we need to be careful with the fact that it doesn't necessarily mean to say that it's going to work properly so we digitally sign things like code we digitally sign device drivers when you pull them down from manufacturers websites okay that all that means it's come from a reputable company or a reputable supplier of that particular code or that driver it doesn't necessarily mean say it's going the end result is what you want okay so so it doesn't guarantee complete satisfaction it just guarantees the fact that it's come from where you think it's come from okay that's digitally signing stuff um again so that's not encryption if we're looking at using asymmetric encryption here then we're laying layering in this public and this private key so again these diagrams always get a little bit convoluted so here we've got good old bob who needs to send something to Alice, okay, using an asymmetric system. So the first thing that they have is a cipher. They have an agreed cipher as per the company. So this could be your internal public key infrastructure, which has a, uh, an encrypting file system, for example, or some kind of encrypted system, which, it, which is dependent upon a cipher. So they're both parties know what the cipher is. 
The key to this, of course, is the movement of a key, a private key from one place to another. And what asymmetric does is it then locks this away by when, as soon as Bob has encrypted something with his cipher, he then takes Alice's public key. So this is publicly available to him on the IT system or from across the network. And using Alice's public key, he then ultimately locks away the private key that was used, the encryption key that was used to create the ciphertext. Then either inbound or outbound, these are sent. Generally speaking here with most asymmetric systems, it's an inbound process because unless you are actually the recipient, you have the private key, you would not be able to unlock that ciphertext and able to read it. So once it's actually then shared with Alice or Alice then opens it from the system, she under her authentication, so as soon as she uses her logon process onto her local machine, for example, onto the system that's using this encryption system, she would have access to both her public key and her private key. She simply then brings her private key that unlocks the encrypted system, the encryption key that Bob used for the original ciphertext. She can then decipher it and she would then be able to read it. So even in the process of looking at the picture and listening to me explaining it, you can see that this is quite convoluted. So in comparison to using a symmetric process, this slows things down a little bit for us, but it does not completely remove, but it does alleviate most of the process of moving a private key from one place to another. Okay, so no IT system from a security point of view is 100% guaranteed. Okay, when it comes to security, Again, it's another one of those kind of t-shirts that we wear. Nothing is 100%. So when we're talking about confidentiality, integrity, and availability before, no system, no SLA that you can ever write or receive is going to guarantee you 100% in any of those three areas. Okay. And generally what we're trying to strive, of course, is high 99.9% in these. But uh, we're also very, very careful in the fact that nothing is 100% secure. And this system is not 100% secure. So there are crypto analysis out there that would allow for these systems to move because all we're talking about here, of course, are just mathematical processes that move a private key from one place to another. The main ones that are in use, in fact, these, these days are the top two, in fact, that you can see on this list, I would suggest. So RSA, so River Shammer Adelman, three great mathematicians. Uh, I say great, I've never met them, but um, I've Googled them a lot. Um, and so this is still uh, one invariably that you will have seen. Invariably, you may be using RSA tokens for authentication. And RSA mechanisms are used invariably for this asymmetric process, used quite widely, in fact. It's kind of slowly being superseded, but it's still with us by using the elliptical curve cryptography, ECC. And again, for any mathematicians out there, I bow to your greater knowledge and understanding of this. So I've had these things explained to me so many times and invariably what happens is I just sort of glaze over a little bit and, and kind of nod um, as if I'm really understanding what these people are telling me. But I, my understanding is that ECC uses a form of maths with calculus. I kind of remember it back in the good old days of, of being at school and I'm thinking, do you know what? I don't think I'm ever, ever going to be able to use that in the real world right up until I started looking at ECC encryption and all of a sudden it came back and I thought ah actually that now makes sense and so what ECC does um, it's quite widely used in fact on um, uh, web content for example so TLS associations uh, these days because it's quicker uh, by virtue of the fact it uses kind of smaller key lengths if you like to secure things up for authentication and encryption out on the internet where you want speed uh, rather than confidentiality, ECC um, does that for you from a from a uh, from a website kind of thing. Uh, Al Hamal, then again, this is these are sort of going backwards in time and, and space here a little bit. Al Hamal is based on a, 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 a exchanging mechanism, which is which is based on again another. These are all mathematicians here that we're talking about here. Diffie Hellman, which was an older system, takes back to the sort of the seventies. This dude, uh, where it's a very simple mechanism simple by the process, but not simple by the maths, in the way that you can uh, safely exchange a key, a private key from one place to another. And this is my, uh, this is my bonus round here, because uh, what this does is it then takes us into, um, today's Friday, so oh, I don't know what lockdown is. I, I actually live in France, so we're locked down pretty, pretty much properly locked down at the moment, in fact. Um, so if you're able to go out to the pub tonight, wear a face mask, wash your hands, keep safe distancing and all that kind of thing. Um, but 
uh, this is my little party trick. So this is very, very good for drunk friends and small children, not drunk children. Or it's probably good for small friends, but, but, uh, but that's a slightly aside. So what this is, is a very simple process that kind of explains a little bit about how two parties can exchange a private key between two, uh, two sites without actually sending the private key. So how do we get a pre-shared secret key from one place to another? And this uses a very simple uh, mathematical trick is what Diffie Hellman calls it. Now, again, I'm going to try and explain this so that you can, in the pub tonight, scribble on the back of two beer mats or if you've got the sticky labels you can use it stick it on your foreheads which is like a little magic trick which will impress your kids if you have any um don't just randomly select any kids out on the street to do this with because that possibly would be a whole world of wrong but try this with a friend at home and see how this works so and again in the words of good old johnny ball think of a number for those of us that can remember him and so what I've done is modified this and obviously simplified the process by using very, very small numbers. So for those of you that know the Diffie-Hellman process, who are now tutting and looking at the sky going, oh, no, here we go. What I'm not doing here is talking about modulus, which is what the system actually uses. And I'm not talking about numbers which are quite long. OK, so invariably, of course, if we were doing this from an encryption point of view, we'd be talking about very, very big numbers, which makes it very easy to compute in one direction, but very difficult to compute in the opposite direction. And that's invariably what this trick is all about. Okay, And this is what the process of moving by using the Diffie-Hellman process from one place to another. Uh, again, on the courses that I deliver as well, I don't, we don't sh show video content very often, but I would also promote this by, there's a little YouTube uh, video, which if you were to Google Diffie-Hellman and paint pots, all day long it sounds a bit odd okay diffie hellman paint pots probably one of the first or second um hits that you're going to get on that is somebody that's explaining this in the good old style of, of of like the the um uh videos the movies that you used to get at school the te the teaching programs that you used to get at school so it's a bit old and dated but it does it quite nicely and it uses uh mixing colors rather than numbers to do this but this is the way that we kind of adapted this so how does this work? So between you and your partner, and you can try, if you've got a piece of paper, you can try this at home. Okay, the first thing that you need to do is agree on a shared number. So in this example here, Bob and Alice have both agreed on the number four. So the green number that you can see in the middle of Bob and Alice is what they've agreed on. There is nothing secret about that number. It's just a, it's just a point in time. Okay, so they both agreed on the number four. The secret bit is the next step. So both Bob and Alice now randomly generate or select a secret private key. So in my example, you can see that Bob has selected number five and Alice has selected number eight. Okay, so five and eight. What happens next is that Bob multiplies his number by the shared number. So he ends up with 20 and Alice does the same and she ends up with 32. Now, for all you cryptanalysis out there now, there is definitely a correlation between 20 and five and 32 and eight. And if you were to, if you were to do this in slow time and say, well, actually, now I know that the number is four, I would be able to work out the rest of this. Okay. This trick is not about um, how it actually works in the real world. This is really more about the process. Okay. So you would generally be able to work this out, hopefully. But if you, do, like I said, if you do this quickly with a small child or a drunk friend in the pub, you will definitely get a wow over, over it. There's probably also a way that you can also put a bet on it to get a free pint or something like that. Once again, friend in the pub rather than small child. And so what's happened here is that Alice and Bob now exchange that number. So Alice sends her 32 to Bob and, and Bob sends his number 20 to Alice. Notice that both of those numbers are not their private keys. Okay, and again, if these numbers were properly calculated, there would be no direct correlation between the number that's being sent and the private key. Okay, so Alice is now in recipient of uh, Bob's 20, and Bob has got Alice's 32. What they now do is they now multiply that received number by their private key, and lo and behold, they end up with the same number. And again, this is a mathematical trick, if you will, that means that they now have derived exactly the same number, even though they've exchanged two uh, different numbers and they've also generated two different private keys 
Okay. And so again, this is that where it gets that wow factor with the fact that you've now done the calculation, you've written in this case, 160, stuck it on your forehead, or you put the beer mat on your forehead. And when your mate slowly sort of works out what their number is and shows you their beer mat with 160 on, they think, how have you done that? As long as they don't think too long and hard about it, you can say, well, what, what that is, is the Diffie Hellman process. Mine's a double. Okay. And that will work all day long. Okay. It's not exactly Paul Daniels, but it's a nice little trick. But it does show quite nicely the mathematical process, albeit dumbed down, of how two numbers can be exchanged without actually sending a private key from one place to another. The system now would allow Bob and Alice to use their defined numbers here to start encrypting from one place to another without the actual physical exchange of a private key. Now, of course, given enough time to have a look at these numbers, evil dude, if he was intercepting these transmissions from A to B, would be able to work it out. So again, this is not 100% guaranteed satisfaction when it comes to confidentiality of data as it moves from one place to another, another. But what you're doing here is putting in the time of the fact that it would invariably take, with the systems that are in place these days, it will take them hundreds, if not thousands of years for most IT systems to actually work these out. And that's exactly what you need. Easy in one direction, very, very difficult, but not impossible in the other direction. Okay, and this is the uh, part of the asymmetric process that allows for this key exchange between one person in this case and another, Bob and Alice. Okay, well that, so again, it's sort of a bit of a bonus, I suppose, really in the fact that you can, hopefully you'll get very, very drunk tonight or you'll impress a whole load of children, whichever one you uh, fancy. So a quick recap on asymmetric does provide us with authentication and encryption, okay? Uh, better key management as well, so these can be safeguarded better than the movement of a private key from one place to another. Support for digital signatures, and again, I'm gonna to talk to you about what a digital signature is in a little bit as well. Removes that vulnerability of the key exchange, okay? But it's slower. So again, what I give you with one hand, unfortunately, take away with the other. It is a slower process. It's using two keys, ultimately, for the sake of one. And invariably, what we find is in, for most security solutions, in fact, a combination of the two generally goes hand in hand. So both symmetric and asymmetric processes go hand in hand. Okay, so again, hopefully that, if you've looked at this before, kind of gives you a little flavor uh, about the kind of things that we look at when we're dealing with these two encryption systems or two cryptography systems, asymmetric and symmetric. Now, a little bit about hashing which as it says here on the slide is not true encryption. Well, it isn't encryption ultimately in the way that we uh, have defined it previously. Okay, but what hashing can be used invariably is as an alternative. And we use hashing in a lot of areas. Okay, so hashing invariably maintains the digital integrity of something. So in the world of forensics, for example, a, a forensic investigation team will hash a hard drive, it will hash the contents of a file, it will hash things to make sure that the original data is exactly the same as the data that you've now taken off of that system. So when you compare the different hashes, or the compare the two hashes, they actually match. So you can say with a degree of confidence the fact that not one bit of data has been changed on the original with what you are actually presenting in court or pre pre uh, uh, presenting as part of whatever material or evidence that you are submitting for whatever reason. Okay, and we do this a lot. So from a forensic point of view, uh, most systems invariably will automatically hash things on our behalf. We don't necessarily have to do it, but there are plenty of programs out there that allow you to actually run your own defined hashes as well. So if, if there was uh, an integrity process that I needed to put in on a file as it went from one place to another, I can do just that. Most of our email systems, for example, that we use have their own hashing within it. And most of our encryption systems, in fact, have their own defined hashing algorithms and, and, and hashing processes in it. Uh, these are called message digests or secure hashing algorithms. Those are two of the sort of the more popular ones, I suppose, that are used. Uh, when it comes to the other aspects of hashing, we can also use hashing in the movement of passwords from one place to another. And that removes some of, but not all of the vulnerability of moving of a user, putting a password in clear text on the line so that it's then sent to an authenticating server domain controller uh, or any other kind of authentication process. Again, again, don't be misled into the fact that this doesn't, this doesn't completely secure up the movement of your password from one place to another because it really doesn't. Uh, and there are plenty of processes out there that allow us to break the hash and already do brute force or cryptanalysis attacks 
using things like rainbow tables, which allow us then to invariably work out what the hash the hashes actually are, and then do replay attacks by using a username and a password. If you can possibly avoid single use of usernames and passwords these days on systems by using multi-factoring authentications, two-factor, multi-factor authentications, that's the road to take on absolutely everything, of course. And it goes, uh, again, from a protect point of view, don't use the same password for everything that you use, especially out on the internet, for example. Uh, it's been years that we've been talking about this and people are still doing exactly the same things incorrectly. Um, for more information about that, contact your local protect officer from your local cybersecurity, your, uh, either your regional um, or, or local force. In fact, there will be somebody there that will give you, either as an individual or as a business, great advice about how to be protecting your systems. Okay, and, and again, they do a lot of great work for you. If you've not heard of them, touch base with them because they're totally awesome. Okay, so again, so from the password side of things, remember, not encryption is what we're talking about here. It's just a movement of a hash value, which re is representative of your password. And the authentication process and authenticating system will then match the hashes to make sure that you have put your password in correctly by using the local security agent local onto that um, uh, operating system, for example, whatever you're using, okay, whatever the system is. Okay, but there is still a vulnerability in moving these things around. Uh, there's a couple of examples for you again, quite blatantly, Microsoft, so NTLM version 2, for example, NT LAN Manager, um, still used, I suppose, really, but a lot of this, for those of you that have looked at systems administration and looked at authentication processes and protocols, uh, certainly within an Active Directory on a domain system, I uh, know that that's really Kerberos that looks after us now from an authentication sort of thing. So different set of protocols which use different types of certification, in fact, so different types of encryption to do that. So even though these are NTLM and NTLM version 2, you will still come across these. Uh, invariably, what we're looking at are older legacy systems or indeed backup systems to Kerberos if you're using uh, Microsoft domains or Active Directory. Uh, so here's a couple of examples then. So MD5, uh, when we're talking about a collision here, so it says possible collisions, that's when uh, two different files actually come up with exactly the same hash value. So the chances of that happening are, is remote. It's very true, okay? But we call that a collision. Now, but is, even though it's remote, it is still possible, okay? So in, invariably to avoid the likelihood of a collision, what we do is increase the hash length. Okay, so the bigger the hash length, so um, so moving away from sort of 128 to 256 to 1024, etc., etc., um, would reduce the uh, the likelihood of a hash collision. Now, again, we have to kind of temper that a little bit with the fact that it is very unlikely that a collision will take place on 128 bit hash value. But if the integrity of your system determines that it the likelihood has got to be minimized to the to that extent that's exactly what you would do depending upon the size of the file of course will depend upon how long that hash takes to calculate so you may find for example if it's a, a terabyte hard drive for example and you're over and you uh, stick a hash on it there's quite a long um, algorithm that it's using it might take a little a few seconds longer or maybe a minute or two longer than it would do if you're using a slightly slower one so again there's a cost in time that's the restriction of this. But again, to be honest with you, that's in, in most working um, experiences that I've had is negligible. Okay, when we're looking at this. And the the remoteness of this taking place, okay, it doesn't really happen. Okay, I've never really been able to emulate it, I have to say. Again, so here's another example. So RIPE, Race, Integrity, Primitives, Evaluation, Message Digest. You can see that it's coming down into something called a message digest. So invariably just a summary of the contents of the file or the um, uh, contents of whatever it is that you're trying to hash. So it could be a, a database, it could be a hard drive. Here's a great uh, little tool then. So this is called HashCalc, which is a nice little tool that you can download. If you wanna have a little play around with it and have a little play, very straightforward and simple to use. And you can see that you can also use a variety of different hashing algorithms here as well. So. Um, uh, this one's using MD5 and SHA1, SHA256 and RIPE MD160, for example, to give you the different hash outputs. Again, another uh, good examples of how hashing works. From a digital signatures point of view, 
However, now we're going back into an asymmetric process where we need to maintain the integrity of the data as it goes from one place to another. So this is used in a lot of cases, in fact. So there's a lot of areas where digital signing or digital signatures are used, uh, not just for emails, so not just for the movement of messages from one place to another. I will also mention things like code signing, uh, driver signing, for example, which quite uh, prolifically uses um, digital signatures these days. Uh, in fact, most modern systems won't accept a device driver unless it's been digitally signed by a reputable uh, organization or manufacturer, for example, Microsoft uh, systems. Uh, and what it does here is validates the integrity of the message or the file. So uh, you can see here that um, when we're talking about digitally signing something, this is almost the reverse of encryption. Okay, so this is not encrypting something. So I am not maintaining the confidentiality of the data by digitally signing it. I am, however, maintaining the non-repudiation and the integrity of the data. So in this convoluted diagram that we've got here, Bob is not encrypting something to send to Alice. So, uh, so this is not going to be the movement of plain text to ciphertext. All he wants to do is make sure that when Alice receives the file um, or the email, whatever it is he's sending from one place to another, that Alice is almost guaranteed that it's not been tampered with as it goes from one place to another, and Alice knows it's come from Bob. So we're talking about integrity through hashing and uh, digitally signing to, for non-repudiation. So in this case, what happens is that Bob will then hash the file Okay, that maintains its digital integrity. So if the hash values don't match at both ends of the um, chain, then Alice will know that something has been altered and something's not quite right with it. Now, Alice's system will know this, not Alice. So Alice doesn't necessarily look at the hashes herself. It will be her email system that, that matches the hashes or compares the hashes from the two, two endpoints. What then happens is that Bob will sign it with his, with his private key. Okay, so this is a private key which is used for digitally signing. This is nothing at all to do with encryption. So Bob signs it with his private key. That is then sent to Alice. In the reverse way that we use the public and a private key for encryption, what Alice then does, or Alice's system, then selects Bob's public key from the system, okay, from across the network, which then matches with his private key. So she now knows, with a degree of trust, the fact that this has definitely come from Bob. Her system then goes through the process of matching the hashes, so they know they both ends know which hash has been used. Both hashes will compute to exactly the same uh, output, hopefully, and so she also knows that it has not been tampered with as it goes has been sent from Bob. Okay, so digital integrity and also the non-repudiation. Okay, and again, there are plenty of systems that use this. This is a sort of a basic. Uh, explanation and example of how this works and of course there are plenty of systems that also use this with encryption over the top of it as well so if you wanted to see it in a more convoluted way I can then also encrypt this as well so use this time using Alice's public key to encrypt it that then gets sent to her so for encryption it's been digitally signed it's also been hashed all sounds fantastic Okay, now some of you possibly do this as part and parcel of a routine email transmission from, from uh, A to B. And some of you may invoke this, okay, on occasion when the data that you're sending, when the message you're sending needs to be wrapped and confidential. You will also know, if you have done this, that it also takes a couple of seconds longer for it to go from your outbox and, and be processed and sent. And you also know it's also fraught from, from danger from the recipient side of things who then phones you up and says, you know that message you've just sent me, I can't open it because I have no idea about what the encryption is. I don't have the certificate invariably to open this up. Okay, so key management, okay, is a key factor, I suppose, really, when we're using these systems. So making sure that your endpoints are using exactly the same integrated systems is a key thing. And again, this also works going out onto the internet as well. So using a public key infrastructure, okay? If we're using external agencies or external references as well, that's when it gets a little bit more confusing, a little bit more complicated, okay? And I don't necessarily want to go down those routes uh, today with you, but we'll talk a little bit about um, the public side of the public key infrastructure when we've had a cup of tea. Okay, with that, I think that um, concludes the first part of this session again so sort of uh, basic concepts I suppose really is what we're talking about with this 
Uh, I've alluded, I suppose, a little bit to the deployment side of things as we've gone through. So um, I'll just take a quick sip of water because I'm drying up here. Excuse me. It's all good for you because you could be you could be sat in the pub. I can't see you. So you could be um, doing all kinds of things. Um, so we'll move on and, and I'll, I'll crack on with this this um, bit and we'll see where we end up. And then we'll break for some questions um, and stop for a quick cup of tea as well. OK, so. Again, without repeating myself, we've already mentioned the fact that um, cryptography, data arrest, data in transit, and data in use. Data in use is the one that's the odd one here, of course, because invariably what we're talking about is the fact that the data has been decrypted from the encryption process so that the users can actually use it and see it. So when we're, you're opening up the encrypted database, which has been stored on your data servers, for example, you may know that the first time that it does the negotiation, it might take a couple of seconds okay, to decrypt it. Depends on how much data, of course, is being decrypted. And then, of course, it's displayed to your users. Okay, One of the key things to remember here, of course, is uh, this could also be, uh, we're talking about data in transit here, the encryption processes that we're talking with VPNs. I cannot tell you how many times I've sat on trains and planes and buses and things like that uh, looking at very busy commuters going into town, London, wherever they're working. And I can see the spreadsheets that they've opened. So, and I can see their emails and I can see the files that they're working on. They're all very, very busy people with their laptops and their phones and their tablets working away before they get into the office. And of course, they may be using a VPN. So it's encrypted when it leaves your office and it goes across the internet to them. It unencrypted as it gets to their uh, desktop, to their laptop and to their phone which means if it's unencrypted for their eyes, it's also unencrypted for Phil's eyes and everybody else that's moving around them as well. So, so all of this, I have to caveat with the fact that it's all very well you encrypting stuff with data at rest and data in transit. But if your users are then going to open up that encrypted data in a public area so everybody can read it and see it and look at whatever the confidential uh, material is, you've completely negated the whole system. So that, my friends, has to be protected with policy. OK, it also can be protected from a technical point of view where the users cannot physically open that up if they're in a public environment. So there are lots of different techniques that can underpin this. So your users are not able to have access to that kind of confidential material, that kind of restricted data. If they're on the train, if they're on the end of a VPN, if they are not within the safe sanctuary of being inside your firewall. OK, and there are data protection policies, lots of these different technical controls that are being layered in now from uh, all kinds of providers. Obviously, I know the Microsoft ones reasonably well. Um, so again, using Azure, using cloud-based resources as well, we can control that that data quite nicely. In fact, that's for, that's another different course. That's a different layer of technology that we're talking about here. But the key thing that I want you to take away from this is that it's all very well us talking about these technical controls uh, and the physical controls as well that uh, they're putting in place as well. But none of it is any use whatsoever if you don't have a policy. If you have not got the procedural controls in place, the user training and awareness, their awareness of what that actually means, um, caveats, classifications, markings, and all that kind of uh, information. So if a user inadvertently opens up a confidential uh, document on the train, they know instantly that that's wrong and they can instantly turn that off and then report the fact that they had access to confidential material when they are not in a in a safe environment. Very few users will do that, admittedly, knowing users. So the systems themselves need to be in place to protect them. But if the policy is robust, if your users are well tr well trained and well maintained, okay, they will know right from wrong. Okay, they will know that they should not be working on those hospital records or those financial records or those databases while they're sat in an open forum, open uh, forum such as a train or a plane and things like this. And again, I tell these stories. Uh, they're not stories. These are these are these are facts. In uh, I, I, in the good old days when we could sit close to people on trains and planes and things like this, um, I travel a lot. In fact, and I travel a lot by train and plane, um, and it will make you weep at some of the spreadsheets and some of the data that I've actually seen opened up on a laptop on an aeroplane, for example, right next to me. Um, where all I need to do is just open up my mobile phone and I could be recording exactly what's happening on the screen. And the user, who's, who's completely oblivious to me sitting next to them, and what I'm doing on my phone, would not know that data is now being breached. 
Okay, so again, of course, I don't do that because it would be breaking the law and it'd be totally unethical, but the reality is that it could be quite easily done. And again, think of you, think of you okay, uh, you can hold your hand up and say, yeah, actually, do you know what, I've done that. Uh, and invariably, uh, guilty is what we will invariably say. Okay, not very many of us probably on this call uh, will not be falling foul of that at some point. So good policy is what we're talking about here. So all of those procedural controls, and that's good management as well, I have to say, uh, that, that uh, puts that into place as well, that underpins that. When it comes to securing data at rest then, I get a couple of examples here. So file and folder encryption, uh, again, quite, uh, uh, quite blatantly here, I'm kind of picking on a Microsoft system, which is um, uh, using an encrypting file system, EFS. That's only on a Microsoft system. There are similar processes that you can do, of course, on Linux um, systems and, of course, Mac operating systems. They all have sort of built-in encryption systems, um, and they all work in pretty much the same way. I have to say EFS is a, is a good example that I'm going to use because it leads in quite nicely to the PKI that we'll deal with after, after tea break. And then we move into the realms of full drive encryption as well, which most of us are probably using on our mobile devices without possibly even knowing it these days. So this has moved quite nicely now into our tablet, smartphone, uh, laptop environments quite nicely, but of course it's equally at, um, at home on desktops and, and indeed in some cases in servers as well, where we're talking about things like BitLocker, full, uh, full drive encryption as well. So that can also be uh, on the go as it were, so uh, for removable drives as well. Uh, if you have confidential material that needs to be moved from one place to another and it's gonna go on a USB stick or a USB drive, then that can also be employed using full drive encryption quite nicely in fact so BitLocker the Microsoft one is called BitLocker to go uh, which has been around for some time EFS as I mentioned then is the one that's built into um, the Microsoft systems has been around for a long time EFS is not really one that's used uh, to, to be completely honest not really one that's used at a user level for users encrypting data themselves uh, but the systems invariably that sit behind um, your Microsoft systems may use EFS or the cipher command to encrypt this as it moves from one place to together. So when we migrate data, for example, you may find that it's encrypted using EFS as it moves from one place to another. EFS is also a great way of encrypting archive data using backup solutions and things like that. So it's, it, is, it is used, but, but it's one of those that invariably is not used from a personal level uh, because it's also fraught with dangers the way that how a user invariably could do this and how invariably you're also going to recover the data and manage any kind of encrypted data as well. So, um, so again, I'll talk to you about that when we, when we deal with the, the PKI side of things. If I um, give you a quick demonstration of this, so using um, Windows 10. Um, Phoebe, how am I doing for time? Am I right? okay time-wise with you? I think I'm doing absolutely. Bill, you've got another half an hour Perfect. until Q and A. Perfect. Okay, so here I am. Uh, hopefully, you can see my screen. Logged into uh, Windows 10 machine. This is my my little demo uh, machine, and so I think I'm logged on as a user called Bob. Who else? And so in Bob's machine, so Bob has already created um, in his documents a folder, I believe, called Bob's Secret Stuff. And what he did with this was that he encrypted it. So he came to the properties of Bob's Secret Stuff into the advanced settings, and he simply put a tick in the box. It said encrypt the contents to secure data. That's using uh, Microsoft-based EFS. It's as simple as that. Now, Bob would need to be an administrator, have local administrative rights to do this. And I'm gonna caveat this quite carefully now, and I'll show you why when we take a little look at this is that you would never really allow a user to do this on a live network, okay? That all of this is going to be controlled by using a certification authority, which is for us after tea break. I would not allow Bob to self-sign certificates, which invariably is what he's done here, um, because there's no control over this whatsoever. I would not be able to recover this data if it went wrong. I would not really be able to audit Bob properly here as well. So there's a whole heap, there's a whole viper's nest of, of badness that's coming your way should you allow your users to do this. Okay, so, so that's all he's done is invariably come through to the properties of this, the advanced properties of this. He's okayed that, okay? And what, what he's done here is he's actually... Oh, somebody asking a question. Right. Somebody and needs to mute if... Um, I mean, the health crisis is not over. 
I'm getting some feedback. Nick, I think it's you. I'm sorry. Nick, if you could just mute for us, that'd be great. Sorry about that. Um, so what Bob has done is he's actually encrypted the contents of a folder. And so um, within here, he simply created a file. Now, creating a file in an encrypted folder inherited the encryption from above. And so this secret for Alice, you probably can't see it from where you're sitting. It's got a little padlock on it. Okay. And again, if I was to put the properties of this on, you would see that one of the attributes for this file would be a big E for encrypted to show that it's actually encrypted. Now to Bob, he can open this up and he can start to deal with it. Okay. So he can start to edit this because he's the owner creator of this. Okay. If he now wants to share this with Alice, however, he now needs to come to the properties of this file. Okay. Exactly where he was before and to the advanced properties, you can see that it's still encrypted. Okay, and then if he comes to the details of this, we can now see some of the metadata which is associated with this encrypted file. Okay, so here's problem number one with allowing your users to use local encryption. Bob is in the only entity that's in something called the data decryption field. So it's only Bob that can decrypt this. You'll notice down in the recovery field, there, that is blank. So I have no recovery agent that would allow me to recover this data if Bob's key, for example, became corrupt or the file became corrupt and Bob could no longer access it. So if Bob phones the service desk and says, I've got a whole load of encrypted stuff and I can no longer access it, nor can you. Okay, so he's lost that data, uh, which is, uh, again, some, uh, one reason why we would not use this. If he wanted to share this with Alice, then invariably, what has he got to do? So remember, if we go back to the asymmetric process, he needs to select Alice's public key from the network, which is going to be used invariably in the encryption process of this file. And so he simply adds from here, and because she's the only other user on the network in here, he can now see that there is indeed somebody called Alice who has also got a local encryption certificate in here. And so he can simply select Alice from the list, okay? And she has now got access to this because she holds the corresponding private key that allows her to decrypt this. And if I was to take a look at Alice's key in here, I should then be able to take a look at the public key from the certificate properties. Now, I'll come back to talk about this in a little bit more depth and detail when we've stopped and we start talking about the PKI because we're talking now about public key um, uh, encryption here. And so I can see that Alice's key allows data on the disk to be encrypted and all issuance policies in here. I can now see another problem with allowing my users to use self-signed certificates. So this has been issued to Alice by Alice. Okay, she encrypted something locally, which is why her encrypted key is now available to Bob on this local machine. And if you can look very carefully at the expiry date, so it's valid from uh, yesterday, uh, uh, yeah, from yesterday uh, up until 100 years. Okay, so there's 100 years validity on this, which is far too long for this key to be knocking around on your system. Okay, and that unfortunately is the default arrangement for a self-signed key. Okay, if we just very quickly sort of round off and go into the public key arrangement in here, I can see the hashing algorithm that this EFS process uses. And so it's decided this is the system that's selecting this. This is the default system, which is selecting secure hashing algorithm one, SHA-1, which again is a fairly weak hash, but it doesn't make any difference about weakness here uh, because for the digital integrity of this, that's all she needs. It's not encrypting anything. And again, remember that we also can see Alice's public key here, which is using RSA, so River Shammer uh, Alderman, so it was the top of the list uh, from when we were looking at these key exchange mechanisms back on the asymmetric process. And it's a 2048 bit key. And you can actually now see in hexadecimal form, Alice's public key. There it is all wrapped up in something called a certificate. Okay, and this would then show you Alice's public key. Alice's private key is safely locked away under her lock and key. Okay, in a credential vault ultimately here, which is in a crypto folder, which is a secret hidden folder on Alice's machine, only available to Alice when she authenticates. And similarly, so is Bob's. So Bob has a private key, which is safely tucked away under his logon 
okay, effectively under the registry of when Bob logs onto this local machine. Now, again, there's another problem in the fact that these private keys, there's only one of them. So if they become corrupt, okay, then that would be an issue. And so from a local point of view, as soon as Bob, in this case, has created something, he is prompted to back up his private key. Okay, and so uh, under the notifications in here, he would see at some point, okay, if I'm logged off and logged back on with Bob, the fact that he needs to back up his private key. Now he can do that in several ways. He can stick it onto a USB stick, so he can uh, uh, put it out externally. He could print it invariably, which is not a particularly good way of doing it, or it could be safely stored away on a file server somewhere. So he does have the ability to do that, but once again, from a key management point of view, is not something that you would use in a real network. Okay, so I've done that demo there just to show you how the encryption process works. So this is file and folder level encryption, and it also hopefully then goes backwards to show you invariably how an asymmetric key process works, and also will go forwards when we talk about PKI. So kind of keep that in your mind's eye for the time being. And when we take a look, a closer look at the PKI, once we've had a cup of tea, we will come back to look at these things called certificates. And again, that's something you can play around with at home as well. So again, if you wanted to take a little look at how, if you've got a Windows machine or a virtual machine as I'm running here, uh, then get to play around with that, get a couple of users on. So create a user called Bob and create another user called Alice get them both to um, locally encrypt something. And you can do exactly the same demo as I've just shown you there. Okay, so uh, it shows you quite nicely the way that these key exchanges move, even though they're not moving particularly far, of course, in the demonstration. Full drive encryption. So here we are talking about disk encryption. So again, this could then be stored, the actual encrypted key here could be stored in several locations. In fact, so uh, TPM, the Trusted Pl Platform Module, which again is part of uh, the BitLocker system. So that's either um, actually in uh, actually part of your motherboard. So it's a chip set, a chip that's in uh, part of your motherboard on mobile devices, uh, equally available. It can also be stored on a USB stick as well. It can also be stored in Active Directory as well. So if you've got an Active Directory domain, you have an auto unlock feature, which allows your full drive encryption, your, your um, BitLocker drives to unlock as soon as the user or the uh, uh, operating system to unlock as soon as a, a user attaches that machine to the domain as well. There's a, once again, confidentiality and integrity. Perfect. Okay, so uh, very good for this. Availability, not so perfect in the fact that it will slow things down a little bit. And also you've got the pro problems with key management here as well. And these are quite considerable, in fact, when we're looking at um, full drive encryption. Okay, the management of these kind of keys. Um, but you can also see that this also allows for things like digital rights management. So managing your data, who can access it, when and how and where, for example, and password protection as well. So it's quite a good system, in fact, that we're looking at. So the TPM is a good way of locking things away. Um, it's not only about um, confidentiality of your data as well. So the latest versions, in fact, of TPM also give you a degree of integrity and the safe boot feature, in fact. So invariably your UFI or your BIOS has to support this um, feature, has to be enabled. Okay, but this then allows you to see whether or not the hard drive has been tampered with. So if your laptop has been out of your site um, and you believe that somebody may have actually been tampering with the hard drive, well, it's uh, not, you've not actually had physical contact with it, then the TPM, the TPM mode will tell you this. It also does safe boot as well from the point of malicious software as well. So it actually goes through a process of allowing you to see if there's any malicious rootkit, for example, uh, or any kind of viral infection. So it actually saves, uh, saves the machine from starting in that condition as it goes through. Once again, these are quite advanced features and have to be enabled in order to take place. That's only on the TPM version, I have to say. You would not get any of those features if you're using a USB um, for your TPM, okay, or for, or for the uh, private key for your full drive encryption. Okay, you don't get that feature. And then moving it up into the big boy league, if you will. So coming out onto the hard, uh, onto the uh, network side of things, we had something called a HSM, which is a hardware security module or high school musical, if you're that way inclined. Um, 
uh, you know who you are out there. You possibly need to take a look at yourself. But these come in all shapes and sizes as well, I have to say. So, uh, and these are particularly useful, as you can see. In fact, so the bullet points in here, so uh, very good for PKI. So if you've got a full public key infrastructure as well, using a dedicated HSM uh, platform, uh, bank card payment systems, invariably you may see these um, being utilized. Uh, crypto wallets as well, so for... Um, uh, cryptocurrencies and crypto wallets out there and again from a web point of view it's, it's got it says ssl connections in here i'll just sort of caveat this with the fact that that's probably going to be tls uh, connections uh, that we're talking about rather than ssl these days and i'll come and talk to you about that in a bit perfect so securing data in transit how do we move data so here we're de dealing with both confidentiality and to a point integrity as well and so there's plenty of examples here that you can see uh, how we move stuff from one place to another so again uh, we're all mobile at this moment in time you're probably also working from home at some point or you have been uh, working from home and telecommuting so all of this applies to all of us pretty much across across the world um, at this moment in time we are now very reliant on mobile technology so whether that's your smartphone uh, your tablet or your laptop moving from one place to another um, uh, we're pretty much driven now by laptop users, aren't we? Whereas in the good old days, uh, they, those were quite a rare event, but, but these days they're more likely than not uh, to be the uh, um, device of choice, in fact. And again, mobile devices, uh, mobile phones, smartphones, and things like that have obviously come to the fore as well. Inherently, the availability of this and the scalability of allowing your users, allowing our users to have this kind of accessibility comes with a price to pay when, it, when we're talking about confidentiality and integrity of data. So when, here is the reverse. What I'm giving you for, with availability, I now need to start thinking about protecting with confidentiality and the integrity. Okay, and so here you can see the types of issues that we inherently have had. So again, I'm, we're going back to the big bad boy of WEP. Uh, people are now booing and hissing and, and throwing beer cans at the screen and things like that. It was it was the security of its day. Unfortunately, that day is now done um, because uh, even though WEP uses RC4, so the stream cipher that we mentioned previously, to, and to be completely honest with you, RC4, I can use RC4 stream ciphers and you, you wouldn't know what it is that I'm transmitting uh, if you're in the data stream of it. It would, might not take you too long to unravel it, but you wouldn't know at that point in time. Um, the vulnerability of this, like with a lot of encryption systems or crypt cryptographic systems, is the start, okay, is the initialization vector, okay, which unfortunately in this uh, uh, system, WEP, was in clear text. Um, for those of us that look at ethical hacking, uh, I'm emphasizing the ethical side to this as well, probably your mainstay, your go-to demo here is to break a WEP key. To be honest, most of us don't probably bother with it anymore because it, if I can't break a web key within two minutes, uh, there's something gone wrong with my system invariably. So we are talking about uh, me invariably being able to access possibly data and internal networks within uh, seconds few, in fact, if we're still using web. I do, do not see it uh, anywhere anymore, I have to say. So it's, it's been a very long time, in fact, since I've seen web being used. I, as I've, I've sort of briefly dropped into conversation, I live in France. Um, and it was quite, it was, it, it's op only in recent times that WEP has actually sort of been removed from my local vicinity in this little village that I live in. Um, uh, I, have, I have noticed, ethically noticed, that some home users have been using WEP. They need to update their routers, I would suggest, which of course the majority of us have done. The interim, I suppose, really between WEP and WPA2 was using WPA, but WPA also used RC4 from an encryption point of view. But this time, the vulnerability was reduced by using something called a temporal key integrity protocol as the uh, initialization side of things. Uh, TKIP, again, not completely um, infallible. Well, it's not infallible, in fact. So um, two minutes for a web key. My, my best for a WPA key is 11 minutes at this moment in time. And again, I don't, I, it's, it's something that I don't necessarily, it's not a hobby of mine. Um, uh, I, I haven't really done it for a, for a long time, to be honest with you, gone against the WPA key, but invariably there might be some of you out there that are hackers galore. who are saying, Phil, where have you been? We can do that in a couple of minutes now. And, and I bow to your um, 
your abilities okay because a wpa is also something that's quite vulnerable these days as well and again we've moved away wpa was also really the interim okay before wpa2 in fact came online and uh replaced it and that's quite a robust system i have to say so wpa2 uses aes okay it uses this counter mode cipher blockchaining message authentication protocol which is a bit of a mouthful which invariably just means that the whole thing is now very secure not 100 percent uh never going to be 100 percent. and i have to say here unfortunately just like a lot of things here the vulnerability unfortunately is the nut behind the wheel is the ultimately down to the user okay weak passphrases okay uh dictionary words uh not changing defaults all of these things that you you're looking at me staring at the screen and going phil 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 you, you what are you telling us stuff that we've been hearing over the past 10 years um well i can almost guarantee if you hook up with my friends the protect law enforcement officers out there in the wide world they will probably be telling you it's still happening okay uh, you know they're banging their heads against the wall telling us that we should be changing defaults strengthening our passphrases and all of this kind of stuff um and it still happens and in fact small businesses uh not uh, uh and invariably some large organizations as well also need to take heed from this it's not just home users that we're talking about even though those are probably the most vulnerable i'm very pleased to say however that the word is getting out slowly and also the word is getting out to the manufacturers of the kit that's provided to us as well that that almost now by default tell us to change the default set security settings on our wireless access points when they're shipped to us the downside is that not all of them give you great instruction as to what then makes a secure passphrase or what a good set of um, credentials would invariably be away from the defaults. Um, so to that end, again, there is still a little bit of user training and awareness that needs to be layered into this a little bit. Um, and again, so without, I, I have no affiliation with um, with these. They don't pay me for this. But, but if you are a small business, if you are uh, interested in the security of Wi-Fi, speak to your local protect. Uh, law enforcement agencies uh, they're only too happy uh, to come and chat to you about this and and again they give de great demonstrations and uh, and great seminars and all talks and things like that they're, they're available uh, and they do great work so uh, i don't know i haven't looked at the list have we have we got any on you have to identify yourself if um if you are one of those say hello to me in tea break if you are one uh, wpa3 again this is a bit of a slow burn laura thanks laura um, WPA3 is a bit of a slow burn for us, but this really is uh, removing that um, idiot from the loop for us as well. It's not really going to be defined, my understanding of this is not really going to be defined as uh, a replacement for WPA2, not anytime soon anyway, but it enhances what we already had have with uh, WPA2. Um, and you can see here that it's now forcing users to use encryption on public networks, public networks and users. Um, Again, if you if you come into the classroom or if you come onto one of the courses, uh, one of my protect courses or or any of those uh, ethical hacking kind of courses as well, uh, what I love to do is is uh, whip my pineapple out, which is not a euphemism for anything other than getting out my man in the middle attack platform and showing you how vulnerable your mobile phone is um, by using public um, uh, uh, access points, and some of them aren't that public, in fact. So. Uh, again, so for, for those kind of demonstrations, it's all day long. Um, we can show you the vulnerabilities of those. Uh, and don't, what WPA3 does, in fact, layers in a little bit, of protects you against yourself, I suppose. And as I said, this is a little bit of a slow burn with this. Um, I'd be interested in if, if anybody's got any uh, indication of how, uh, how prolific this is, or inv invariably, if you've layered any of this onto your network, uh, let me know, because that's, uh, that's good intel for me. Uh, there's not too much of this happening at this moment in time, though, is my, is my take on this. But it will be good. Okay, this will be good. So this is uh, the future is kind of bright with this. Uh, there's a quick and dirty then looking at uh, wireless security. So again, this is a fairly old wireless access point. I can tell you that it's old because it still has got WEP as an option on this particular device. And again, most modern uh, domestic appliances don't give you the option of that uh, these days. So again, take a look at your home router. Okay, so sort of a bit of a bonus ad here. Uh, once we've done this Friday afternoon, before you go to the pub to win that pint off your mate with a beer mat trick, take a look at your wireless access point at home and change the defaults for me. Make Phil happy. Make Laura happy uh, down in Cornwall. 
and or anywhere else that you may sit and um, change your defaults on your wireless access point. Now's a good time to do it. Okay. Um, file transfers then. So again, I'm going to uh, sort of speed up a little bit because I'm sure we're gagging for a cup of tea. Um, so secure shell. Again, these are really just examples of how we're layering in the encryption process over some sort of rudimentary and some of the basic ways that we invariably connect to our devices remotely. So uh, SSH in here, secure shell, different variations you can see in here with version one, version two and open SSH. So a good replacement for the old way of telnetting or terminal emulation, a, a way of invariably getting onto a server remotely and sending command uh, strokes to it. Um, an SSH can actually be layered in over a lot of different mechanisms that we use, uh, such as copy, the copy command, so secure copy, FTP, file transport protocol. And a good, good, good tip here, so tip for the exam, if you're taking a test, if the S is at the front of the protocol, it's invariably using SSH. If the S is at the end of the protocol, it's using SSL or TLS. So you can have FTP, which has got S at the front of it, SFTP, which is using SSH. If you see FTPS, it tells you that it's using TLS or SSL. So again, that's not a hard and fast rule, um, but that will certainly help, help you if you're studying for Security Plus, Network Plus, or any of those kind of um, exams. So watch out for those. Um, there are some, there's always a flying ointment. There's always a, a few that uh, buck the trend a little bit. Um, and so, especially when we're talking about VPNs, for example, okay, and SSL is used on a VPN, but the S is at the front on that one. Um, I don't really need to talk to you too much about SSL. The slide does it quite nicely, in fact, um, uh, how it kind of all works a little bit. But the, the last bullet point, really, in this one is the kind of the key uh, to this one in the fact that it's been largely replaced now by Transport Layer Security TLS. Okay, there have been some known vulnerabilities to SSL for a little while. Okay, it is also a bit clunky uh, these days when it comes to uh, connecting invariably here, we're talking about connecting to uh, web servers and things like this, where, where we need the connection to be nice and slick. Your customers need to be able to connect seamlessly to your websites without any delay and things like this. We've done this, haven't we? It's infuriating, isn't it, when the, the site doesn't load properly or it doesn't connect properly and you have to refresh your browser or, or you get a certificate mismatch error and things like this. Invariably, what's going to happen is your, your customers are going to go elsewhere where they don't get those errors, okay, where they don't get that problem and where they've, they've got a degree of um, assurance, I suppose, really, in the fact that you're looking after their security for them. So, um, so these days, invariably, if you were to hook a network monitoring solution on, even though you might see SSL banded in there, invariably it's using TLS, and there are different versions of TLS that we're looking for. And TLS, as we've mentioned, can be layered into a lot of different security protocols or application protocols in here. So email, VoIP, again, is a good one. Instant messaging systems. Uh, these kind of uh, teleconferencing systems as well use TLS and the LDAP, which is a lightweight directory access protocol, which is used for uh, interrogating and the movement of um, databases. Invariably, here we're talking about Active Directory, potentially if you're in a Microsoft domain uh, using LDAP. Uh, this is the handshake that takes place. Again, here we're talking about um, connecting to a web server which has got a certificate bound to it that allows it then to offer you through port 443, uh, a TLS transmission, uh, a transport layer security in here. Now, again, I haven't uh, if, uh, come back and uh, see me on the 30th of October, quick plug, because what I'm going to talk about then is uh, network security for people that don't really want to worry about OSI reference models and things like that. So it's got a networking security for the non-technical um, and but part of that process, of course, is the fact that there are layers of, of how things take place. And I've got a neat little way of showing you how this works, but I'll save that for another day. What happens ultimately here is that a handshake takes place between two, two um, computers, so between your client and the server. And you can see them here. So the bit above the dotted line is what we call the TCP handshake, a three way handshake. OK, then. Once the connection has effectively been established, but before the session has been secured at the transport layer, a certificate exchange takes place. So the client says hello. So a client hello message is sent to the server who responds with uh, the, the client then gives a list of um, ECC, RSA, for example. These are what we can do because I'm a Windows 10 machine or because I'm a Windows 8 machine. And these are the encryption algorithms that I can use. 
the client then looks at that, takes that and sends back a server hello and says, right, okay, based on you, what you can do, this is, this is my certificate, okay, and this is what I can do, and this would be the best way that we are now going to secure this handshake by using a TLS, and we can also authenticate each other with this. So this process is all done in the blink of an eye once you have done the initial physical configuration of the TCP handshake, and all of this happens at the transport layer, hence transport layer security. The session is then established using invariably what used to be called SSL, but is now using TLS. Okay, and these certificates are then exchanged. I'll give you a demo of this when we, I'll show you this in fact in the real world when we start talking about the PKI. Okay, so I'll hold off on that. And there is HTTPS, so that's what I'm going to show you after we come back from a break. So I'll give you a quick demonstration of what that looks like on the internet. Very quickly then looking at email services. Okay, so SMIME, Secure Multipoint Internet Mail Extensions. Again, these are just uh, invariably um, systems that are widely used, I suppose, really from an encryption point of view in here. So SMIME, another good one. Well, this is pretty good. In fact, this one is pretty good privacy as well, PGP, which again, a lot of you are possibly using as well. There are open source versions of this used quite widely out on the internet. And so um, you can see here that this uses something called a web of trust model. And again, we'll hold off on that aspect and I'll talk to you about that when we talk about the PKI. If you are using open uh, PGP or indeed its sort of counterpart, uh, GPG, I see this a lot in fact with cryptocurrency systems. Uh, once you set up your uh, cryptocurrency in your crypto wallet invariably based on your email arrangements that may be using GPG, public and private key arrangements in here. Uh, the problem I've seen with some of these in fact, well it's not a problem if you're a law enforcement officer, but the problem that from your privacy point of view is that the, your pr public key is, is publicly available and may also be mapped to your email address as well. So please, 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 if you're, if you're using these kind of systems, check the confidentiality and integrity of yourself and what it is you want to use them for. If you are a criminal and you're on this call, forget what I've said. Okay, continue using GPG because Laura and her friends love it. Because as soon as you start buying guns and drugs and rock and roll off the dark web with your cryptocurrency, they can find you. And long may that continue. Not you buying drugs and rock and roll off the dark web. Police officers finding wrong ones. Okay, so, um, so again, be very careful with some of these systems. Okay, so especially the open source ones. Okay, and there's a quick breakdown then of secure email. It looks like I've got just a couple of minutes to finish off with um, VPNs. So virtual private networks, invariably you know the, what these are. So there's the definition really of what a VPN is. And if you've not come across one of these over the past six months and you're possibly live, living under a rock or you haven't been working from home or you're using cloud-based resources. Again, so VPN, even though it's a, a traditional way of connecting to resources on the internal network, for example, or establishing a secure connection between two endpoints, a lot of us now are moving up into cloud-based resources, software as a service, Office 365, which in some way, shape or form also negates the needs to have, for us to have a VPN. So again, it's kind of countered a little bit. Of course, we are then secured by using TLS going up into the cloud. Uh, these are the sort of the basic tunnels or the tunneling protocols that we come across and in no real um, list, I suppose, really no sort of order of preference. You can see the point to point tunneling protocol, which took the point to point protocol, which is invariably a traditional dial up and secured it with encryption. L2TP, layer two tunneling protocol. There's that OSI thing again. I'll talk to you about that in October. I bet you can't wait. That took layer two forwarding. That's a Cisco thing. And so from a Microsoft point of view, the layer two tunneling protocol uh, doesn't actually afford you any confidentiality. So from an encryption point of view, you need to think about encrypting your data uh, as it goes from one place to another. And a mainstay with that is you can actually see from the demo here, from the, from the screenshot, that that's generally done with IPsec. And IPsec, even though it's not a strictly a true tunneling protocol, is a series of protocols, it's what we call a protocol stack that allows us to encrypt, encapsulate, and also then authenticate using two of the main protocols within that protocol stack. That's called ESP, the Encapsulating Security Payload, and Authenticating Header. That's also a very popular 
uh, protocol, which is used on mobile devices using something called the Internet Key Exchange version 2, so IKE, um, part of the uh, IPsec family, if you like, because it uses the Internet Security Association key management protocol. Those are the protocols that we use for establishing IPsec and IKE uh, systems, IKE Internet Key Exchange. And there's a mobile version of that, which is called the mobile IKE. The one that I've missed out there is the secure socket tunneling protocol, which uses TLS. So this uses certificate services to secure two endpoints from an encryption and authentication point of view. And the reason why that's popular is because it has less overhead uh, invariably on your firewall. Okay, traditionally come through on port 443, where the others will have an impact on your, far, your commercial firewall. Um, and also is relatively easy to set up as long as you have got certificate services running. And it's kind of a neat little package, I suppose, really. So, so again, even though I have no uh, real preference over these, IPsec all day long for strong, strict confidentiality and integrity, and SSTP for confidentiality and integrity at an affordable cost to your network. I'm not talking about pounds and pence here, I'm talking about cost to your network and infrastructure. As a quick finish of this then, I think that timing is pretty much spot on. Uh, there's a quick roundup of IPsec. Again, uh, uh, if you are in certification mode here, if you've come to learn some stuff and get some golden tips from Phil on what do I need to know for exams, pretty much all of that list, if, you, if, if I um, tickled your fancy with um, CompTIA, Security Plus, Network Plus, CISP, BCS, CISMP, all of that kind of stuff, and you think, is it IPsec important to me? The answer is yes, okay. Uh, and again, if you capture this slide, in fact, there's a couple of golden nuggets in here, which are always, always mainstays in pretty much across the board. From an examination point of view, uh, they would expect you to have a good understanding about how IPsec is broken down invariably into these three key uh, protocols. So I have the uh, authenticating header, AH, ESP, the encapsulating security payload. And then, as I've just mentioned, in fact, the security association part of this, which is all part of ISACEMP, the Internet Security Association Key Management Protocol. Okay, those are the three to sort of, um, to remember, I would suggest, that come together to fuse together to create this thing called IPsec. Now, um, again, you don't need to use all of these. So if I only want integrity uh, for my tunnel, I only use authenticating header. If I only want confidentiality, encryption, then I can use encapsulating security payload. That then reduces the bandwidth a little bit, a little bit of the overhead for me, speeds things up a little bit. Uh, but again, it's an offset against what your data actually is as to what layers, which protocols you're going to use. Okay, with that, and I think that, perfect, takes us to a nice natural break. I'm three minutes over, so I, I apologize for that. That's not bad for Phil, to be honest with you, because I normally waffle on for a lot longer than that. I am very happy uh, to take any questions, comments, criticisms, or anybody got any good jokes or anything like that to see us through to tear break. Stony silence. Um, oh, I've turned Teams off, so I can't see Teams from my partner in crime. Uh, what was that question? Uh, is this an open course? If so, could I have details of it, please? Which course is that? Uh, Wayne, are you talking about? Ah, uh, yes, this is one of these. In fact, so it'll be a very similar format. It'll probably be very similar times in a very similar environment. In fact, um, yes. So uh, that's the networking security for the non-technical, I think. Is what we're calling that. So uh, again, I won't I won't big that up just yet. But um, but that's sort of Phil's take on on the uh, the OSI reference model and TCP without me being too bothered about numbers, but me being bothered about the security elements of that. If that makes sense. Good. That's a, that's just a that, that's just a plug for another course. Has anybody got anything to do with encryption? Or everybody happy to break for a cup of tea that's normal that normally when the instructor says everybody's happy to break for a cup of tea is normally just a bomb burst out for everybody breaking for a cup of tea um no all good phoebe are you still with me are you absolutely still here happy to um well do you mind giving it a couple more minutes um and then if no more questions by seven past then we'll have a break 
seven minutes wait. past. And, so, um, <laughs> and we'll continue. We, we still won't start until half past, I don't think. Okay, um, brilliant. That suits everyone. I'll make sure to put a note on there. But just brilliant. a couple fantastic. more minutes in case anyone's thinking of a question while they're making tea or something. Okay, fantastic. Uh, normally, of course, on a uh, if it was a training event, uh, rather than this sort of one-way flow of Phil uh, delivering stuff, um, we, obviously a lot of demos, a lot of questions and answers and things like that. Um, at the moment, you'll be aware of the fact that Firebrand are delivering, well, in fact, we're now back in the training center. So, um, so we're back up and uh, kind of semi running uh, with limited capacity, obviously with social distancing and everything that's in place now. And I'm pleased to say, if you know this, if you know the site that uh, we're back up and fully functioning in the, from the hotel side of things as well now as well. So, so all of the, distraction free environment is still now back up and running if you prefer that kind of model um obviously uh oil the online instructor led courses which is invariably what you're receiving now um those are also super great as well i have to say so we've adapted and adopted those fairly quickly um it's it's kind of all i'm doing at this moment in time i was back in the uk just before france went down into lockdown um, I actually live in France, so I can't go back to the UK without having been quarantined for two weeks. So, so it kind of makes it difficult for me to travel back to uh, home base at the moment. Um, so everything that I'm doing at this moment in time will be oil. But uh, but last time I was at Y Boston, I actually did hybrid courses as well. And those kind of neat. So I had physical students in the classroom and then this online um, uh, training event as well. And I have to say that it works really well. But um, uh, if you're in kind of two minds about what, what's good for you, um, have a look at all three options, I would suggest, because it, it, what, it, they generally work well for most people. And in my um, experience, uh, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a very much hands-on kind of dude. I, I prefer the old model, the firebrand model of uh, bums on seats in front of me, um, books and hotel. You roll out of bed, have your breakfast, roll into a classroom, learn some stuff, roll back into bed, totally knackered, but full of hopefully knowledge, pass an exam on a Friday and bing, bang, bosh, jobs are good. And, um, Whereas that's a little bit more convoluted and a little bit more sort of spread out, I suppose, with, with the oil deliveries these days. But I have to say that there is no uh, lack of pace and commitment and quality is still exceptionally high on the hybrid and the oil deliveries as well. So they're running quite nicely. In fact, so all three models are invariably very, very good. Um, and of course, they're very interactive as well. So, so generally, it's not just me lecturing, if you like, and it's not my style at all. Um, I don't like to be sort of sat on my backside, just going next, next, next on PowerPoint slides. Um, so this is a little bit artificial. This isn't really how we do it, I have to say. So, um, but if you, hopefully if you're enjoying these, um, there's a lot to come. As Phoebe has said, there's a lot of different, um, it's not just about security, there's a lot of different sort of um, uh, courses in the pipeline. So have a look at them because um, some of them are quite good. Some of them are quite good. They're all good. Cool. Um, and normally, of course, I get to find out who you are as well, but there's quite a few people actually on uh, on the chat at this, at this moment in time. Laura has identified herself to me. So I know Laura from the good old days um, uh, from Y Boston. So in fact, she's um, she's great, is Laura. Do we have any other police officers that want to identify themselves to me? Not the ones that have arrested me in the past. Uh, those that have uh, I've met under favorable conditions. He's not. Is that seven minutes up, Phoebe? Have I waffled on now for my? I've gone over the waffle time, haven't I? I think that's I think that's fair. I think <laughs> um, we'll leave it there. Um, if you could please give me back host rights. Oh yeah. Um, I'll stop the recording and then we'll all come back at eleven thirty for the next session. Does that suit? Uh... You have control. Brilliant. Thank you.